This is footage from the most elusive total solar eclipse of the millennium. You might have some burning questions on your mind now, such as, what makes this eclipse so much more elusive than all the other eclipses we get about once every 18 months? Also, why is this recorded in a plane when it's much more con- Wait, before moving on, I hear voices from below. Who's talking? Nope, cloudy. We got up at just after 3 a.m. to watch the beginning of the partial phase, which was happening roughly here. So yeah, here's what happened. Both me and legendary math YouTuber Matt Parker traveled to the Southern Hemisphere independently to watch the total solar eclipse of 2021. But as you can see from these time and date maps, the path of totality only passed over ocean and Antarctica. The closest inhabited area was the Chilean city of Punta Arenas. So if you wanted to see the eclipse, you had three options. A, cruise ship, B, step foot on Antarctica itself, or C, ride in a plane. Options A and B did have a ton of advantages over C, including getting a full 360 view of the sky, not having to look through a window pane, being able to rejoice in a spacious area, and bragging rights that you went to a remote travel destination. But option C had one advantage that sealed the deal for me. You're above the clouds. Now yes, some days it will be sunny in Phil Antarctica, but you know how weather is, you can never quite predict cloud cover months in advance. So being a little risk averse, I signed up for this TEI Eclipse flight plan arranged by Glenn Schneider, Tim Todd, John Beatty, and LatAm Airlines. And in this video, I want to talk a little bit about my own experience with this whole trip, what I meant at the start when I said most elusive eclipse of this millennium, and I want to talk about eclipses in general, because I do want this channel to be a place for science education after all. So my friend Peter, who came on the trip with me, was the one who actually recorded that eclipse footage from the beginning, and that was on his iPhone 13 duct taped to the airplane window. I think we're at about T, T minus 20 or so minutes until totality, and here's the setup we've got. We have Peter's iPhone 13 recording the set, although it's not in focus, taped to the wall with iPhone glasses filtering it out. What does the sun being eclipsed by the moon really look like? I know. Come on. Oh, so close. He had this to say. So Peter, how many people do you think saw this eclipse? I think about 300, which is about this percent of the population in the world. See, here's what we were thinking. Only 14 total solar eclipses have happened on Earth so far in the third millennium, the vast majority hitting habitated land. We figured if it did hit habitated land, it would be easy enough to get to for a guaranteed 1,000 eclipse chasers or so to see it, and that's not even including the locals of the area. 1,000 is obviously low-balling it, because tens of millions of people lived in the path of a few of these, but the point is, it's at least 1,000. Now for this 2021 eclipse. Obviously, since the only land it hit was Antarctica, there were no locals in the area. Not only that, but we think there were 11 or so ships that swam out to the eclipse path, but the passengers of those ships, including Matt Parker, were unfortunately clouded out. There were also a couple groups of people who saw the eclipse from Antarctic land, but Peter thinks there were fewer than a hundred of those. Now for us, the TEI flight plan Peter and I were on consisted of two planes, colloquially called blue and gold, and since each group of passengers got an entire row, each plane had no more than 100 people. I also heard one of the Google founders and their families may have had a private voyage to go see it, but that's just hearsay, and a family can't be more than, I don't know, 20 people? Anyway, that's all to say that even though there's no concrete data, this eclipse may have been the least witnessed eclipse since at least 2000. Now let's switch from the real universe to the virtual universe to learn the basics, such as what causes an eclipse. I'm not quite sure what compelled me to do this, but I just created the world's crummiest version of Celestia. But hey, at least I did it in under 300 lines of code, so if this was some sort of hackathon challenge thing, I might have won something. We have the sun in the middle, the Earth as a blue ball, and the moon as a gray ball that's orbiting that, and then they each have a shadow trailing them in the opposite direction of the sunlight. 
And then I also added Mars with its two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Now, none of this is to scale size-wise, but it is to scale time-wise, which means that just like in the real world, the moon orbits the Earth about 12 times for every time the Earth orbits the sun, and the Martian year is about twice as long as the Earth year. Also, I just learned this, but Phobos and Deimos orbit Mars in a matter of hours, which is why they're like 100 times faster than the moon. So when do eclipses happen? Well, when the moon travels through Earth's shadow, we have a lunar eclipse, and when the Earth travels through the moon shadow, we have a solar eclipse. But if that's the case, why don't we get two eclipses every month? Because the moon orbits the Earth every month, and they line up twice in orbit. Because like in reality, we only get one of each type every six months, which is rarer than how often I change my bed sheets. Okay, that was a joke. That's not for real. Well, this is one of those situations where it's helpful to bring in the third dimension because the plane that the moon orbits the Earth on is different. It's tilted from the plane that the Earth orbits the sun on. Now in the real world, the difference between these two planes is only about five degrees, and this is called inclination. But in my visualization, I've exaggerated it to 30% so you can really see what's going on. Because of this tilted orbit, the moon's shadow very frequently goes far above and far below the Earth. Now imagine tilting a CD and dipping it into a tub of water. The surface of the water will intersect the CD along a straight line, right? Well, on this visualization, I've drawn that intersection line between the two planes as a straight line from here to here. And what does that tell us? Well, if we tilt it to the side again, we can see that the moon is only passing through the Earth-Sun plane when it crosses through these two intersection points. If everything were flat, then a new moon would always give us a total solar eclipse, and a full moon would always give us a total lunar eclipse. But looking at the tilt of this curve, we can see that a new moon will only turn into a total solar eclipse if it also lines up with the moon passing through one of these intersection points. And that only happens when the intersection line also lines up with the Earth and the Sun. And that happens roughly twice a year, here and here. And that's why the major eclipse events including partials, annulars, and totals, are all roughly about six months apart. So in this tool I made, we can take the perspective of one object looking at another object by clicking on that first object and then right-clicking on the other object. So this is the view of the Earth looking at the Sun, and you can see that the Moon is passing in front of us at every new Moon, and only when it goes right through the middle, right there, do we actually get a total solar eclipse. And then it passes below for about five or six months, and then it will start rising again. You can also see Mars in the background, but that's not really relevant. What I think is interesting about all of this is that, say you're on the Earth and you don't realize that you're actually orbiting the Sun, it can seem like some mysterious force that is making the Moon go up and down like this, like it's a sine wave coming from somewhere, but in reality there's nothing that's actually waving up and down. What I also think is fun about this tool I made is that it's getting all its data from this very basic JSON file, and if we wanted to we could actually start nesting orbits. See every object has this parent variable which tells you which object it should be orbiting, so we could actually nest orbits and have moon moons orbiting moons. I mean, if you think about it, moons here are just second level planets. So a moon's moon would just be a third level planet, but we can go one level deeper. So if I just copy this last chunk here and put it at the end, well, the moon's ID is two because I added the sun, the earth, and the moon. Let's say the distance is 80. The period, let's make it 100 frames. Let's make it purple by having about 128 red, zero green and 255 blue. And one thing that'll make this really interesting is if we make the inclination 90 degrees, which basically tilts it up on its side like the planet Uranus. And this will make it very clear that we have a completely new foreign object in our solar system that I just added. Then we can restart the simulation by clicking play and we should get a vertically orbiting moon's moon. Oh, there it is, there it is. Oh my God, okay, I... Let's see if that worked. That actually kind of worked, but I'm kind of losing track, trying to get a good view of it. So let's see, if it, I can change the vantage point to Earth by let's see, pressing space and then clicking. So from Earth's perspective, we have the moon orbiting the Earth and then this purple planet, purple moon's moon orbiting the moon. And actually they're like about the same size and about the same orbit, so I don't think that would make sense. I think they just collided just there. I feel like in the real world, Every orbit has to be maybe 5 to 10 times smaller than the orbit one level up because, because otherwise the gravitational pull of the main object, in this case Earth, would be too strong and it would just pull the, the purple object away from the moon's gravitational well. I mean, in this simulation, gravity doesn't really exist. They're just going along perfectly circular paths. Okay, this might be a stretch, but I think this means that with enough lines of code in that JSON file, you could add enough objects to do a Fourier transform of any signal 
because like the the positions of these planets is essentially a repeating sine wave and you can add them onto each other by adding moons of moons and you can change the radius of the orbits and the frequencies and the offsets, and that is pretty much all you need to make a Fourier transform. So overall, this eclipse trip was one of the most exciting experiences I've ever had, just because of so many personal firsts. It was the first time I'd stepped foot in the southern hemisphere, first time I planned international travel by my own volition, meaning it wasn't family or school setting everything up, the first time riding a horse since I was maybe 6 years old, the first time I had to complete final projects and papers for school while thousands of miles away, and it was my first time having my passport stolen, which was actually a silver lining because it gave me a reason to tour the US embassy. That's not the embassy. Peter and I also had this fun mini business venture where we designed Eclipse based t shirts and printed 12 of them in a local t shirt shop in Santiago, barely minutes before the bus to the airport was departing. It was so hectic, I felt like I was on the amazing race. But it was totally worth it because we got some enthusiastic customers. Number right. one customer! Yes, we have Colleen, who's the first person who bought one of our t shirts. Modeled it around. Yeah, yeah, helped promote it for other customers. Yes. It looks awesome. We also met a ton of new friends also seeing the Eclipse, who introduced us to the world of Pokemon Go and this cute plushie called Nova Nauta. And maybe we might see a few returning faces at the solar eclipse of 2023 in Western Australia? That might be fun. And also there were just so many other interesting little quirks, like the fact that TEI had to find a trained pilot who could fly the plane in small circles just in case we arrived at the location of the start of the eclipse a few minutes before the sun arrived. Wait, that's called sunrise. Which caused the bright side of the plane to keep switching from left to right to left to right. So as this video ends, I just want to give a big thanks to Glenn Schneider, Tim Todd, John Beattie, and everyone else at TEI for letting an opportunity like this happen. And I'll see you later. Goodbye.